Now, earlier this week, we reported that the blizzard dropped in whopping 50 inches of snow on the uh, upstate New York City. And it has caused many people to question uh, uh, about city preparedness for uh, weather in, weather uh, disasters such as this. And we also reported yesterday when a young woman by the age of uh, 22 years old, um, Annadale Taylor, she had unfortunately froze to death in her car when she was returning home from a shift at a Buffalo hospital and how she was not able to make it home uh, because of the blizzard conditions there in the city. And as a result of that, um, it has brought a lot of attention to how Buffalo has handled uh, the, this snowstorm, particularly in black communities of the city. Now, uh, there's been a new report that was just released, folks, from the Washington Post that said that, and I would take a look at this here, here are the numbers, and then we're gonna check in with Lauren Burke to give us some more insight. But take a look, according to the Washington Post, while black people make up 14% of the population in Erie County and 33% in Buffalo, they account for 51% of the storm's deceased. Residents and area leaders indicated that structural problems, including poverty, food deserts, subpar housing, and a lack of government investment, have worsened the snowstorm's impacts on working class, black and brown communities, as the cost to the city has become more apparent. Those neighborhoods surrounding more affluent and whiter suburbs appear to be more prepared to respond to the historic snowstorm, even having their power restored faster and roads plowed quicker. Wow. Now take a look, it says this area is so heavily impacted by these systemic issues and it's largely because of poverty, said Pastor Al Robinson, according to the Post, and impoverished people happen to be people of color. He has hardly slept since last Thursday as he and his wife Vivian have provided care and shelter for 130 people in his church since the blizzard onslaught. Now we also take a look at just some of these, uh, the photos here, but the blizzard fuels racial and class divides in polarized city. Let me tell you, man, oh man, we cannot get out of the space of talking about race in this country, even down to the weather. Folks, I'm so happy to be joined by writer and uh, analyst Lauren Burke to give us some insight as to what does this all mean and, and, and how will the city of Buffalo and other cities that may potentially be hit with weather disasters, how will this impact policy and, and how cities handle things moving forward. Lo Lauren, thank you so much for being with us. It's good to reconnect with you. It's been a while. <laughs> yeah, Faraji, I've been watching you though. Uh, <laughs> great show, man. It's great to thank see you. you. Great to be talking to you. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. So <laughs> Lauren, what, what, what do you make of this? Like, I mean, it's one thing to already have, and, and again, we're, we're going back to the sister, the story of the young, the young sister, 22 right. years old. Right. Unfortunate situation, but now it's like, even in a weather disaster, race and politics play, still play a part. And now they're saying that, uh, according to the post of this whole snowstorm, that these white areas, they got better responses from the city, snow was plowed. Like, what? What? how, how do we handle something like this? Now, now we got, along with all the other issues, if it rains too hard, if it snows too hard, we might still be hit with another challenge just simply because we black. Absolutely. Well, as you know, Faraji, uh, black people sort of over index for poverty in this country, uh, 28 uh, percent. You also know, of course, too, that money is what drives politics. Money is what makes politicians do X, Y and Z and pay attention to certain constituencies. You see it all the time, just in general terms where certain issues come up uh, in front of Congress or in front of yeah. local governments because money is paid into that issue by, by certain groups. Now, you wouldn't think you'd have to think about that for a snowstorm, right? But the, the reality of it is, is that the way we treat poor people in the United States is certainly not the way we treat rich people in the United States, whether it's Buffalo or any place else. Um, we see it with just basic infrastructure issues, particularly in the South, uh, you know, notably, uh, President uh, Biden did a very good job at getting a lot of money out through the American Rescues Plan for uh, for infrastructure. A lot of these local governments just don't give it to poor communities or black communities. But when it comes to a natural disaster, that really goes back to a local government and really the governor of New York State. Quite frankly, I think Kathy Hochul was not uh, well prepared for this. 
Uh, she is a, a fairly new uh, governor, uh, given what happened, uh, sort of unexpectedly coming into office as lieutenant governor after the crisis that hit uh, Andrew Cuomo. But if you remember, Andrew Cuomo, uh, when, when there was a crisis, uh, tended to, particularly a, a, a weather-related crisis, he would typically get the National Guard out, which is what right. typical protocol is uh, for a major snowstorm in New York. And as somebody who's a New Yorker, uh, I can remember growing up uh, as a teenager and, you know, we had, you know, five, six feet of snow in, in on Long Island. I can remember in the 90s, some major snowstorm and wasn't uncommon the National Guard would be a part of that. You'll notice the National Guard was not called out for this uh, disaster. And it is it is not really a, there's no real excuse for this because, I mean, this is not the 1800s or the early right. 1900s where we don't have the technology to know that there's going to be a big snowstorm. We know that climate change is real. We've seen these extreme weather uh, uh, incidents down the country becoming more and more prevalent. So I think Hochul made a big mistake, frankly, underestimating the storm. Uh, I know a lot of people putting stuff on uh, the, the mayor, Mayor Brown, and I'm not saying that he should not be part of the blame. He should be part of the blame, but he does not have the power to execute some of the assistance that the governor has. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, my mother worked in New York state government once upon a time, and so did I. And I know what that looks like, and it doesn't look like what we saw last week. And, and there was just no excuse for people freezing to death and, and finding bodies outside and, and, and women, you know, freezing to death in their car. And there was a baby that froze to death. This is not the type of st stuff you should be hearing in the year uh, 2022. But and, and my question is, Lauren, even with that level of history and preparedness, I mean, there was a lot of snow. That was, I mean, and I, and I could be wrong in my reports. Mm -hmm. There was, I reported 50 inches. And I'm like, I don't know what city would be prepared for such a major blizzard in such a short period of time. This wasn't like over a week's period. This was pretty much like a weekend that that this blizzard hit the city of buffalo do do uh, what what could a city do to prepare for something for a hit that hard well i think that the idea that you know oh we didn't know it was coming it was a big surprise i'm not a big i don't buy into that a whole lot because, no, no, me, me uh buffalo is a place where snow happens a lot <laughs> my uh my grandmother used to live in in uh in albany once upon a time and uh you know, uh, big weather events up in that part of New York, uh, particularly in the part we're talking about in Buffalo, uh, you know, it, it's just not that big of a surprise. Now, I'm not saying that a governor or a mayor can predict exactly what the snowfall is going to be, but certainly the weather, the local weather uh, uh, media, meteorologists were certainly ringing the bell pretty hard. And, you know, this is one of the reasons why And I, I know in, in our part of the country where, where we kind of get these weather emergencies. If you're in, in Northern Virginia or Washington, D.C., you know, a lot of times we'll get an emergency and absolutely nothing will happen. But you'll right. notice that the, uh, you know, the media does tend to overplay it. I would say that it's better certainly to overplay something and be wrong than to underplay it and be wrong. But in right. a place like Buffalo, overplaying it should have been almost like the default setting because they have gotten major snow just as a, a general rule. So I, I don't, I think that, you know, when you're an elected official, you know, you're responsible for these things and it's no no joke. And, you know, we've seen what it looks like when elected officials do well and alert the public way ahead of time and really, really get loud and ring the bell, you know, do all sorts of stuff, put out state, you know, states of emergency. And I don't know that we saw any of that. I can't speak in, in grave detail because I don't live in Buffalo, so I don't know exactly what they were doing. But yeah. what, what, there are some things certainly the governor did not do that I think uh, is are fair fair things to bring up. Has there been any talk, Lauren, or any type of response from the city um, about this situation of you know people being find uh, people found frozen in different areas of the city in the cars the baby what has the city how has the city responded to these well you know they're still i think in the the, the dazed and confused stages of this crisis i i just think that they're still you know getting over the the fact that this whole thing happened and that frankly they weren't prepared and you know as the as time goes by from the crisis and you look at these numbers building I think it was 39 dead or 40 dead. And of course, half of those people are black. Uh, you know, there's going to be have to be some sort of obvious after action report. 
and some sort of obvious after action conversation about why this happened, because I absolutely should not be happening with the level of technology that we have, not just around meteorology, but the, the ability that we have in our society now to communicate to a large group of people in a short period of time is a hell of a lot better than it was in the 1980s and 90s, you know. So, uh, you know, I, I, I think they're still in the dazed and confused stage of figuring out, you know, how this happened. But yeah. they got to get out of the days and confuse because, you know, winter is not over. And certainly in Buffalo, it wouldn't surprise me if they had another event before the uh, winter season is over. Wow. Wow. Folks, we have been having a conversation about the Buffalo blizzard and how it has highlighted racial and class divides in the city of Buffalo. We've been checking in with Lauren Burke, who is of uh, Black Press USA and of the host of the Burke Files and uh, having this conversation with Lauren about what the implications are for this blizzard as we look forward. Uh, but the black folks and black residents of the city of Buffalo are suffering now as a result of this blizzard. And I can only say my heart, our hearts and prayers go out to them um, as they are trying to figure out how the city is going to help them out the situation. Um, let me go to Lauren. I want to bring you back into the frame, but let's go to our online culture crew to hear what folks got to say, because now there's just this ongoing sense of frustration and unfortunately, you, you brought this up, like whenever there seems to be a weather event or some sort of nat nat natural disaster, black folks are at the brunt of it. We, we, we're taking a hit for it, Lauren. And, right. and I don't know about you, I'm just, it's, it's, it's so overwhelming and yet tiring <laughs> to see this type of disparity with, I mean, a natural situation, something that you would think well, would, quote unquote, unite people to come together and say, you know, what, we need to help one another. We need to make sure everyone is good. But now it just seems like everything that comes down, uh, down the pipe, whether it's from God or from man, <laughs> it's just like we take the hit for it. And, and I'm not sure how to really manage that emotionally, mentally, because racism is so I mean, it, it runs so deep in this country biases run so deep in this country, it's literally killing us. Well, right. And poverty is poverty is what is behind a lot of that. That We, we in this country, uh, we treat poor people differently. It's just a fact. If you go to right. any city, you right. see it. Uh, it is, uh, we really don't care about poor people. We don't care about people who don't have money. It's pretty yeah. heartening actually to see Karen Bass, new mayor of LA, start out with an emergency on the homeless. Uh, because that's something that is a, a huge issue here. But to go back to Buffalo, it's, uh, you know, what poverty does is it places a lot of barriers in front of people just to have to live their day-to-day -day lives. The food desert issue, you know, a lot of these people seem to be caught out there because they were trying to get food or they were coming back from food or, or something related to that. But also, too, that the governments are sort of able to get away with treating poor people like this without any real political, uh, without any political penalty. That's a that's a huge problem and a huge issue here. Absolutely. Let me go to my crew because folks are checking in. All right, let me go to Conscious Thoughts. You said the whole uh, the entire apparatus broke down, Conscious Thought, relative to the storm and the response of local and state governments to it. The entire apparatus. I remember this is so so reminiscent, Lauren, of Hurricane Katrina. Right. That's right. That's exactly right. <laughs> that's exactly right. I mean, that's a perfect example of how you would never have seen that had that been white folks out there struggling to do whatever. Uh, that, that's, that's exactly right. It's exactly right. I just can't believe we're back at this. And, and, and the sad part about it, and you said it, the season is not even over yet. So there could be another weather, weather event that can hit harder. That was written in the report as well. The city is still trying to recover from another uh, weather event that happened last month. Now people are complaining that since the snow has melted, you know, they're, now they got to deal with the issue of flooding because of warmer weather it's expected. So the issue of flooding is coming up in a lot of these homes that black folks reside in. And so the city is the city may may say, well, uh, you know, what I mean, kind of throw their shoulders up on the situation. And it's like, again, we're always taking a hit. Janae, you checked in and said it's also called wear and tear which is why we need an infrastructure bill. Each census or, de or decade, you can say Buffalo is used to be, uh, used to have 80 plus inches, then say we'll wait till after we exceed that amount. Mm. Mm. Hmm. That's right. <laughs> and, and, and so 
does, does is that the place that we need to like the infrastructure bill? Like, does the do states need to to really look at a a separate infrastructure bill? Well, outside of the federal government's bill, I, I think that what is there. I mean, a lot of this is directed is is directing assistance to the right uh, people who need it more. You know, it's always interesting to hear things like. You know, the the wealthier parts of the city got more help. Yeah, of course they did. But the, the wealthier parts of the city need more help. I mean, a, a snow plow can go down uh, somebody's street if they're rich or poor. But yet I, I actually think that there isn't any extra money that needed to happen. It's somebody standing someplace making a decision to send assistance to a specific neighborhood or not. And what a lot of times that's based on, frankly, is just somebody's personal whatever in their head about who's important and who isn't. So at some point that has to be looked into. I think the other mistake that they made too, um, I think they sent out an advisory that, oh, they we're gonna have you know excessive wind and some snow, et cetera. And of course there's a big difference between sending out an advisory and sending out a mandatory stay at home order. Mm. Uh, people in sort of the right mindset of, okay, this is a big crisis. This is something that we got to stop what we're doing in our lives and, and deal with. But when you're, when you're somebody who doesn't make a lot of money and you need to be at work, That's the like, you're going to have a different view of that, of somebody asking you to stay home. Of course, we saw this during COVID. Right. People were trying to work anyway when we have this deadly pandemic. Uh, fortunately, uh, the term of, of Donald Trump ended and the term of Joe Biden started, and he he really treated he really targeted some assistance to that particular mindset and that particular issue of the average middle class or lower middle class person making a decision to work and risk their lives doing so. And I actually think the same thing happened with this situation in Buffalo. We and, and I'm glad you brought that up. We got a few seconds left, but I, I'm glad you brought that up because I'm thinking about Andell Taylor, 22, coming uh, coming home from work. Even though she's working in a hospital, do, do you think that this 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 tragedy will open a door for us to have some different conversations about non-essential and essential work workers, especially for hospitals? I mean, yes, we praised the hospital workers during COVID, and then we also kind of like demonized them at the same time. And then now, in this situation, you're still bringing people into a space where they they feel compelled to go to work. So right. is, is this going to change how we work, especially in areas that are more prone to weather events like this? Uh, probably not. It probably won't change the conversation about essential and non-essential because, of course, a hospital worker or a nurse is going to be deemed essential almost every time. And wow. as somebody who yeah. knows a bunch of cops, they're always essential no matter what the heck is going on. Uh, they got to go in and they got to go to work and risk whatever they have to risk to go to work. Um uh, I, I do think that if we're going to call people essential, particularly nurses, then we have to pay them an essential salary that reflects how essential they are. We certainly do that with police. And no, there's no true. reason we can't do it with with nurses who are, who are underpaid. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I also, also, you know, I know that some some employment, some some employers actually sent out a shuttle. They might have, right. a, you know, it's hard for me to believe that a hospital making millions and millions of dollars right. can't invest in some Hummers uh, or some other piece, you know, transporting uh, uh, transportation to bring people in, to, to, right. to bring people in. So that way this won't be an issue. Lauren, I truly appreciate you for giving us an analysis of this whole situation um, and, and, and how, you know, we should look at it again. We're taking so many hits this year. And I hope and pray that come next year that we're going to start to see some changes. Yeah, me too. And it's great seeing you, Faraj. You're doing a me great too. job. And I'll be Thank watching you. you. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate Thank that. I appreciate that Thanks a lot. So <laughs> Absolutely. A lot. <laughs> Thank you. Lauren Burke checking in from Black Press USA and host of The Burke Files. Black Star Network is a real um, revolutionary right now. Uh, thank you for being the voice of Black America. All momentum we have now, we have to keep this going. The video looks phenomenal. See, this difference between Black Star Network and Black-owned media and something like CNN. You can't be Black-owned media and be scared. It's time to be smart. Bring your eyeballs home. You dig? 